Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lynette Roth and I'm Daimler Curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and Head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. And I'm going to be serving as our moderator uh, later on during today's talk. Uh, before we begin today's program, the Harvard Art Museums acknowledge that Harvard University is situated on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Massachusetts people, and we at the university strive to honor this relationship. I wanna thank so many of you again uh, for joining us for this week's session of our series, Art Talks Live, which offer an up close look at works from our collection uh, with our team of curators, conservators, fellows, and graduate students. And you can join us on Zoom every other Tuesday at 1230 for these short interactive talks, which investigate artist materials and techniques reveal our latest discoveries, offer a fresh look at old favorites, and explore big ideas using the collections of the Harvard Art Museums. I know we're all pretty old hat at this by now, but I just want to remind you we are in the webinar format, so if you would like to submit questions, you can do so in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenter will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we will dedicate the last 15 minutes or so to the Q&A. And we will conclude the talk today at around one o'clock. So I'm very pleased to now introduce today's speaker, Sarah Lund, who is the curatorial graduate student intern in the Division of European and American Art at the Harvard Art Museums, and also a PhD candidate in history of art and architecture at Harvard. Sarah's talk today is the third in our series related to a museum-wide initiative entitled Reframe to reimagine the function, role, and future of the University Art Museum. This series of talks, which will run until early June, will examine difficult histories, foreground untold stories, and experiment with new approaches to the collections of the Harvard Art Museums, reflecting the concerns of our world today. Sarah's talk, I think, falls into several of these categories, including untold stories. And she's going to speak to us today about the female revolutionary and printmaker, Amira Sargent Marceau. And we're in very good hands with Sarah, as this uh, is partially the subject of her dissertation, which will feature the work of women printmakers. So with that, uh, welcome, Sarah, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lynette, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, let's get started. Dark smoke obscures a once blue sky. Lines of soldiers and pointed bayonets gather at the base of a mountain fortress, and in the foreground, stubs of branches or roots emerge from a crumbling pile of red earth. In the center of this scene of warfare's destruction stands a confident soldier, leaning easily against the earth with his gently crossed legs. Encased in military finery, he shimmers in his blue uniform with ribbons of silver embroidery, shining buttons, jauntily tied red sash, and glinting hat. The soldier's body becomes the site of his patriotism and of his virtuousness, all the way to his blue, white, and red plume atop his hat a colorful trio that referenced the three-pronged motto of the 1789 French Revolution itself, liberty, equality, and fraternity. The prince protagonist is Francois Severin Marceau de Gravier, a general in the French Revolutionary Army that fought against Austria and former French aristocrats to defend the new French Republic established by the revolution of 1789. As the print tells us, Marceau de Gravier became a soldier at age 16, a general at 23, and died a war hero fighting against the Austrians at age 27. This luxurious color print aggrandizes its hero in his statuesque pose, its large size, over 20 by 15 inches, and the image's fine materials. The image is printed in no less than six colors, which are layered atop one another to build up rich tones and complex shading. This means that six individual copper plates had to be carved and then carefully printed on the same sheet of paper in perfect alignment one by one to build the body of this revolutionary hero. In the layers of this print or this body, however, lies another story that of the artist who connected its subject and its maker, a woman and a printmaker in her own right, 
Emira Sergent Marceau. Emira Sergent Marceau was wife of Antoine Francois Sergent, the designer and engraver of our print, and sister of the war hero pictured. It was likely thanks to her that Sergent was able to draw the general from life, as he proudly notes in the print's inscription. He was so proud of his brother-in-law's revolutionary service that from this print onwards, he added his wife's last name to his own, the two of them sharing the name Sergent Marceau. Emirat Sergent Marceau was born outside of Paris as Marie and later scrambled the letters of her name to form a new one, Emirat, in a moment of revolutionary fervor. She moved to the capital in 1789, just in time for the French Revolution. The French Revolution would not only overthrow the monarchy, but also massively increase the demand for printed images, catalyze the fundamental rethinking of politics, culture, societal and gender roles, and introduce the idea of citizenship, integral to France's new representative and Republican government. In this talk today, we will examine the participation of women in revolutionary politics and culture. Traditional scholarship has detailed the exclusion of women from revolutionary politics. And indeed, women were eventually prohibited from voting, from holding political office, and from participating in political clubs, as the new fraternity sought to masculinize the public sphere and relegate women to the domestic one. It is precisely this type of social, political, and heroic masculinization that Sergent's print of General Marceau perpetuates. However, women did participate in the revolution. Women led marches to the Royal Palace of Versailles, participated in revolutionary violence, presented before the National Assembly, as we shall see, and made prints. Today, we will examine the printed production of three female artists, including Emira Sergent Marceau, trace the theme of the body as the site of the formation of revolutionary identity, and consider the new modes and redefinitions of citizenship that these women put forth, including artistic practice. Emira Sergent Marceau was herself a professional printmaker and worked on some of the most ambitious projects of her time including Le Vacher's series of portraits of the deputies of the Estates General. The Estates General was a legislative body made up of equal representatives from three societal groups, the nobility, the clergy, and the third estate, or everyone else, from wealthy merchants and lawyers to farmers and printmakers like Emirat Sergent Marceau. When King Louis XVI called the Estates General to meet in 1789, the third estate quickly protested their ill treatment and separated, declaring themselves the National Assembly and calling for a new constitution. This was the start of the French Revolution. As scholars like Amy Freund have argued, print series like this one not only satisfied the desire of consumers to collect and hold the images of their new government, but also reflect some of the most pressing questions of the revolution. In particular, how to visualize a government made up of hundreds of representatives in a way that celebrates their individuality, but also emphasizes their unity. Emira Sergent Marceau carved each of her figures in similar bust poses in round framed templates, but she also experimented with the flourish of varying garlands atop each frame and used aquatint and careful carved lines to capture the idiosyncratic bone structure expressive brows, and even hair texture of each deputy. By engraving and producing these images, Emira Sergent Marceau participated in the urgent revolutionary need to reconcile the individual body with the collective one. Emira Sergent Marceau's earliest prints done before her move to Paris in 1789 also directly concerned the body. They were designed to be worn on it. On the left, her sheet displays a series of approximately one inch roundels filled with scenes from popular theatrical dramas that were meant to be cut out, put under glass and fashioned into buttons for coats, vests and other garments like the popular men's and women's threading goat. The 18th century saw a mania for buttons which could be made out of anything and everything from carved ivory to insects and prints. So Jean Marceau's prints for buttons are also printed in color, 
which we can tell from the tiny registration dots at each edge of the print, pointing to her mastery of this difficult and advanced technique. A later print of button-destined roundels from 1789 takes on an overtly political theme, that of the three estates or the three classes. Currently loosely attributed to her husband, in light of Emiral Sir Jean Marceau's many contemporaneous series of printed buttons, like the example we just saw, I believe that like so many other female artists, her work here may have been mistakenly attributed to her husband and that we should consider this print as hers or at least as a collaboration. The print represents two visions of the kingdom. Three figures embody each estate or class, the armed nobleman, the white robed clergyman, and the plainly dressed representative of the third estate, everyone else. In the top row, the third estate alone carries the weight of the kingdom, symbolized by a blue orb decorated with gold fleur-de-lis, the symbol of royal France. In the lower rows, supervised by justice, the three share the burden. It is the bodies of the figures that signal to us their commitment to the nation, just as it would have been on the bodies of the wearers of these buttons that their own revolutionary commitment would be publicized. As buttons, these prints were meant to be cut, reshuffled, and recombined by each purchaser. Although laid out in a teleology of social progress on the full sheet, in their eventual form, they hold potential for infinite redefinition and modification, encapsulating the dynamism and instability of the revolution and its imaging. So Jean Marceau's prints also center the role played by cutting in negotiating revolutionary identity, the most violent forms of which, namely the infamous guillotine, her work eerily foreshadows in the decapitated busts that float in the sheet's right edge. In these prints for buttons and in Sergeant Marceau's portraits of the deputies to the new National Assembly, we have seen how the physical body became a key site of understanding and showcasing revolutionary identity and citizenship. By shaping those bodies in the carved metal printing plates of her prints, Sir Jean Marceau made room to participate in revolutionary citizenship as a woman. What happens when this body is a female one? What did it mean for the female body to be depicted in action, and particularly in revolutionary action? Louise Pitou's 1792 print shows us exactly such an active female figure. In her scene, a female figure skillfully leverages her body weight to hoist a statue atop a pedestal. Louise Pitou worked in Paris in the late 18th century, often producing prints after the drawings and sculptures of Jean-Guillaume Watt, of which this Harvard Art Museum print is an example. A troop of Bacchants, followers of the ancient god of wine, Bacchus, raised the statues. In their classical dress and horizontal frieze-like composition, the figures are inspired by ancient Greece and Rome, like so much of the neoclassical style popular in the late 18th century and prized by the French Revolution. The female Bacchant who leads the construction effort arduously pulls the heavy stone in anticipation of its weight and gravity and pressing upon the pedestal. Printed in 1792 as the French Revolution intensified, Pitou's print of construction echoes the simultaneous building of the new nation, here posing a woman as its leader. Beneath her, two female figures assist in the statue's erection, their strength and dynamism conveyed to us by the swell of muscular arms and swish of dresses as they both push forward. One of the women looks out at us, the only figure of the troop to acknowledge our presence and thus to insist on the recognition of her work in shaping this scene of construction and collectivity. Not only engraved by a woman, this print was also sold by one. The inscription at the bottom signals its availability for purchase at the bookshop of one Madame Crapart whose business was located near the Saint-Michel Square in the core of Paris. A revolutionary era drawing in the Harvard Art Museum's collection showcases not a female allegory or mythological figure at work, but rather very likely a specific woman. Its creator, Marie Adelaide castellas Watt, was not a printmaker, but a painter and a draftswoman. She was part of one of late 18th century France's most prominent artistic families. Married to sculptor Jean-Guillaume Watt, whose design Louise Pitou printed, and himself the son of an engraver, 
Kostyos Mwat's family network included painters, architects, and printmakers, notably her two sister-in-laws, Rose Angelique Mwat and Elizabeth Melanie Mwat, both engravers. In this double-sided drawing, Kostyos Mwat seems to be inspired by printmaking's linearity, as she uses short, sharp marks and cross-hatching to delineate the form of a young woman. Kostyos Mwat drew many sketches of her family members, from which the Harvard Art Museum's folio is likely one. Seated at a table with her hair tied back and eyes focused downwards, the drawn figure gently but pointedly grasps something between her fingers. Could she be perhaps one of the artist's engraver's sister-in-law at, at rest in the family workshop? This drawing, as I mentioned, is double-sided, displaying a similarly hatched and shaded portrait of a seated man on its other side. It is this male portrait, however, that is listed as the front or recto, while the female figure is cataloged as the back or verso. This distinguishment may be due to the male portrait's apparent further finish, but I think Castellos Mott's double-sided sketches beg us to ask how female work and subjectivity has been veiled or minimized, not only in history, but also today. What would happen if we were to reframe the portrait of the female artisan as the front? This drawing and its cataloging remind us of the work we must do to illuminate and analyze the artistic production and engagement of female artists who have long been marginalized and to take seriously and learn from the alternate modes of citizenship and agency that 18th century French women invented and insisted upon when excluded from official participation. Castel Smot was indeed an active participant in the French Revolution and spearheaded one of women's first organized political acts. On September 7th, 1789, 21 female artists and relatives of artists presented their jewels and artworks in donation to the new nation. The print shows the group of women surrounded by the all male representatives of the National Assembly. Included in this group was a now unidentified printmaker Mademoiselle P2. Linked to Castellos Mott by her engravings of her husband's sculptures, an example of which we saw earlier, Louise P2, I argue, seems a likely candidate to solve this mystery. Together, Castellos Mott, P2, and their 19 compatriots formed a sorority to counter the revolution's fraternity in what was, as Nicole Pellegrin has argued, an assertion of their professional and sexual identity. It was through their professions as artists that these women assembled and gained entry into the physical, legal, and symbolic core of the new French nation. To return to our first print of today, General Marceau asserted his citizenship through military service, while its maker, Antoine Sergent, did so as a participant in the radical Jacobin political club and member of various governmental committees. These opportunities were not open to Emirat Sergent Marceau, Louise Pitou, or Marie Adelaide Castellas Mouat because of their gender. But that does not mean that they did not participate in the political sphere or passively accept a status of second rate citizenship. I believe that we should consider their art as their political speech and action. Print created the revolution's heroes, documented its history, allegorized its construction and physically decorated and signaled the bodies of its citizens. As our artists literally shaped, carved, and impressed the new and precarious revolutionary body into being, they also used printmaking to think through and assert their own revolutionary citizenship as women and as artists. More importantly, together, they carved new paths forward for citizenship and political participation when official paths were blocked and ask us in turn to redefine and reframe what we count as participating in cultural, social, and political life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, uh, for, first of all, for introducing us to the work of those three uh, incredible women printmakers, but also uh, for reminding us of the centrality of printmaking to the French Revolution itself. So, um, I'm sure that our participants agree uh, with me. This was a wonderful introduction on, on so many levels. Uh, I am, I can't stop thinking about these roundels, these buttons. Uh, They're fascinating. Uh, Marceau's and um, you so wonderfully 
sort of described to us this tension between the individual body and the collective body mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, in the revolutionary period. And I was wondering, is there a significance to the fact that these two images, the one of uh, the third estate carrying the burden and then the one of sort of sharing, sharing the burden of the kingdom, significance that there are sort of 12 buttons and six of each of these images, would that would it have been a sort of typical number for you showed a waistcoat. I, I was also curious. Yeah, let me go back to some of these. Men, for men or women, these buttons were intended? Yeah, so great um, question. Uh, to first answer about the number, actually what's so interesting about this print in particular is that if you notice at the top how it's cut, and especially on, you can notice this on the right edge, as you see that someone has started to cut around the top curve of that um, left, uh, rightmost, sorry, uh, roundel. Um, and so there probably would have been more on this page. Um, so, which is speaks to the ways in which these prints were made to be sort of cut up and um, manipulated and rearranged by the person who bought them. Um, and they would have been worn um, both either by women or by men. I'm showing here an earlier set of buttons in between a close up of actual buttons on the left on a men's coat and on the right, a woman's um, dress. So either one, but more, more often actually on um, male uh, clothing. So which is also interesting to think about the ways in which this female artist is making works that are going to be decorating and um, forming the bodies of male citizens. And I think too, this idea about the collective and the individual is so fascinating um, because it's such a tense question for the revolution itself at that moment and moving away from the singularity of having a king into this idea of, okay, we are all citizens. We're all part of this representative government. And she kind of makes that clear for us in this print, because if you notice, there's text actually written in the middle in the parts that would have been cut out and thrown away. So I think, mm -hmm. I like to think that she's asking us to, before we cut them, to also think about what they're like as a group. What does it mean to look at all of these little pieces together as well? So it's a, it's a great question with lots of different avenues you can track it through. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, the idea of actually wearing the print on your body, you know, and then also, obviously, as you present yourself to the world, present, you know, this, um, this visual argument. We had uh, one of our participants who was as fascinated with this as I was, and uh, she asks, um, what you think about the bust without a head that appears on the button sheet, if you could just speak about that a little bit more. Yeah, these are probably the biggest puzzle that still remains for me um, in this sheet. So because they are so strange, um, I think this figure may be a member of the clergy um, based on, the, especially in this middle roundel, you can kind of see his um, specific coat and perhaps even across here. And in an early revolutionary moment, which this print was from, the clergy was sort of one of the key um, groups that came under attack. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be sort of anti-clerical sentiment being expressed here. I, I think it's so interesting how um, it kind of echoes eerily the work that the guillotine will do a couple of years later. So the guillotine has not kind of made its entry into the revolutionary moment yet when this print's published. So we can't make that connection explicitly, but to think about how already the idea of fragmenting the body is kind of key in revolutionary critique. Um, so, to answer, it's, there's still a mystery, but I'm thinking through what what kinds of underlying messages they could say and hope to do to do more to figure them out um, in further archival work. And we've talked in previous art talks when discussing prints, also about the. I mean, you you described that so beautifully at the outset with um, the print of of the revolutionary male hero. You know how many sort of stages it takes to print these uh, six different colors, and also you know we've talked about in previous art talks how expensive that is. So one of the questions uh, that came up actually from two of our participants was how how much would have these would these buttons have cost, and would they have been available? 
uh, to everyone or was this really something just for uh, nobility? Yeah, that's a great question. And so prints kind of spanned a really wide range in, term of, in terms of cost. The um, first example uh, that we started with, I'll just flash it quickly um, for us. Uh, this print on the right is an example of a more luxurious one. It's rather large. And so would have been less than buying, you know, a small painting, but something that a working class person would not have been able to afford. It would have been out of their, you know, equivalent to like their living um, wages. But the buttons would have been very cheap um, and something that would have been accessible. Um, I'll bring, uh, yeah, so we see here a set of buttons would have been accessible to a wider range and were designed to be so, as opposed to some of these other examples of buttons mm -hmm. made out of much finer material like ivory, carved mother of pearl, um, porcelain. So buttons could be made out of all sorts of different fine materials, also metals, um, jewels even. Um, so the printed buttons are sort of actually the, you know, the more accessible version of this, the ability to style yourself still with something colorful and, um, and uh, dynamic, but at a much more affordable uh, price point. So would have been available to, you know, a lower middle class um, audience. Uh, it's fascinating. I, we have a, um, a question uh, uh, that says, it's interesting to consider the work of these printmakers to larger changes for women artists during the revolution, such as the opening of the Salon de Louvre to non-academicians and therefore more women. It says the Academy had limited its female membership to a maximum of four women. Uh, uh, yes, so that's kind of, it's more of a comment than a question, but maybe you'd like to pick up on that. Sure, yeah, I'll bring back um, some of our other images together here. But yes, so exactly as you say, these um, female artists were, uh, were limited uh, from participating in the official French Academy, which was the artistic institution that governed the salon, which was the premier space to display your work as an artist. So in order, and it was open to the whole wide public, anyone could come and see these paintings. So that was sort of the place if you're an artist, that's where you want. To display your works. And until the French Revolutionary moment, there were only um, four women who were allowed to be members of the Academy at any given point in time. So uh, as opposed to the, you know, hundreds of male members of the Academy. Um, so and during the revolution, the Academy was abolished and the salon was open to any artist who wanted to participate. And that was a huge moment for female artists, um, particularly for painters, which was the medium prized at the salon um, and being able to showcase their work. But actually printmakers did too exhibit their work. Actually, um, Emmy Ross or Jean Marceau ex exhibited three prints in the salon of 1793. Um, so some of these printmakers also were engaging with that exhibition space. Um, but also as especially the buttons um, showcase, prints were existing in a much wider circulation of visual material um, that would have been part of people's everyday lives in a way that the grand paintings at the salon uh, would have been for their moment of exhibition, but then afterwards gone into the hands of uh, you know wealthier elite collectors or into state institutions. So that's what I find so interesting about these prints in particular is that they moved within and without a, a circle of visual images that pervaded everyday life too. Yeah, and one, one example of that that uh, one of our participants brought up was also uh, the production of political cartoons and caricature. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we were uh, curious whether women were active in that form of political art as well. Yeah, they were, they were. Um, they were also participating in caricature um, images that were used you know, for direct political ends um, during the revolution. Again, Serge Jean Marceau is an interesting one here. She has another image that I didn't bring in today, but of um, the royal family, their heads are on the bodies of animals like a turkey or Marie Antoinette was compared to a wolf. Um, and so that's another example of the type of images that she was making that fits sort of in this, the, this theme of caricature, especially during, popular during the revolutionary moment. 
that's so fascinating, Sarah. I'm sure we could keep talking about this <laughs> for hours. Unfortunately, we're out of time. So I will wrap it up there. There was a lot of enthusiasm for your talk in the chat, and I'm sure that we all uh, look forward to hearing more from you on this subject as your research progresses. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in and encourage you to please take our survey, which you'll receive after uh, the talk ends today. And I hope that you'll join us in two weeks time on Tuesday, April 20th for our next Art Talk Live, when we will hear from Julie Wirtz, our Beale Family Postgraduate Fellow in Conservation Science in the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies. And Julie is going to speak to us about how technical study can help us better know the unknown makers of Egyptian textiles. So please join us for that. And join me in thanking Sarah again for a wonderful talk today. And uh, check out our calendar and we'll see you again soon. Thanks Thank so much, Sarah. You. Thank you. Thank you all for joining.